never give in. Never, never, never. When I was growing up in South Wales in a small village outside Abergavenny, I used to hear rumours about local farmers and country people who had been recruited into a secret underground army during the Second World War. Later, I found out that those rumours were in fact true, and that there had been an organisation called the Auxiliary Units, a network of resistance cells that stretched throughout the British countryside. For this week's Open Country, I've returned to South Wales to explore the hidden remains of the Welsh resistance and to speak to one of its surviving members. The key issue from a military point of view is that although this is quite a sort of an out-of-the-way place in, in, in many ways, we are only five miles north of the Neath Valley. And the key strategic concern really was the oil industry between Swansea and Neath. So there was an oil refinery at Clandarcy. If an invasion was going to capture this area, then at least they would make sure that the oil refinery wouldn't be operational for some period of time in the future. Mm. I'm walking through the uh, countryside north of Neath, and I'm here with Martin Locock, who's a historian from the National Library of Wales. The general approach was that they needed to try and make sure that all of the country had some form of defence. Mm. Um, so most of the, sort of the obvious defences were actually put around the coast. So there's a lot of work put into pillboxes and so on and anti-invasion concrete blocks and things, basically trying to make sure that it was difficult to land. But they accepted that once an army had successfully landed, it was going to take some stopping. And so really what they were hoping to do was by making life difficult for an invading army to move forward, that would give the forces that were based in the Midlands in England an opportunity to turn around and basically face the threat. Mm. Um, so that it was really a question about sort of using the land to buy the time. And so that's the philosophy both behind the auxiliary units and also the use of the river valleys in particular as stop lines. It was suggested that the Churchill's Fight Them on the Beaches speech was actually inspired by the idea of the auxiliary unit and this idea of actually having to fight for every inch of ground as the invasion happened. That is fascinating. That's, uh, and actually, when you think of that speech in the light of what we know about the bunkers and everything, I mean, that is very interesting, the idea of fighting them on the beaches, we will fight them in the hills. What sounded to most people perhaps like rhetoric, I suppose in his mind, was very, very literal. Yeah, no, I, I think it is. He had a vision of the entire countryside becoming a hostile area for the Germans to have to cope with. And, of course, I suppose... It's only recently that we haven't had to think like that. Because I suppose, you know, coming from Wales, you're very aware that the landscape has always been identified as part of the defence. You know, the mountains and the hills, that is literally where the border is because it is the landscape that has, over the centuries, protected the country. And I suppose that was something else in the idea of the auxiliary units that attracted me immediately, that it sort of tapped into some very ancient patterns in Britain. And I suppose some myths, I mean... There's that British wide myth about the sleeping lord and his sleeping army, this army that will rise again, you know, literally from within the landscape, to save us in an hour of need. Yes, I, I certainly I think there's, there's something about caves in particular, that people like the idea of there being people asleep underground who will emerge when they're needed, which of course is exactly what the auxiliaries were intended to do. So we've come to the top of what was quite a long hill and we're just catching our breath under what I think must be one of the most remote uh, bus stops I've ever seen. <laughs> we're in the middle of nowhere and there's a bus stop. But because we are this high, you get a much better sense of the landscape from here, don't you? And that actually is the sea that we can see over there, isn't it? That's right, yeah, you can just see the sunlight. On a, on a good day, you can actually see across the Devon. And so that's really why the auxiliary base is here. The big issue was, well, what happens if a large army lands in Pembrokeshire and then starts moving towards England, what can you do to stop them, given that your main field army is actually based uh, over near Reading? It's clear it's going to take some time to be able to mount a serious defence, so in the meantime, what can you do to slow it down? So I'm walking along Abervan Beach, which is a stunning view this morning. The sun is out, and it's just revealing this incredible expanse of sand and sea stretching out across Swansea Bay towards uh, Mumbles in Swansea. I'm on my way to meet with Roy Coleman, who at 87 is one of the last surviving members of the Welsh Auxiliary Units. So, Roy, how did you come to be recruited into the Auxiliary Units? When the war broke out, I was too young for the armed services. 
I was in a reserved occupation as a miner. Every miner that was reserved had to join one of the services, i.e. home guards, artillery fire service, that kind of thing. I chose to go with the home guards with the guns and all the rest of it. But anyway, uh, after about a month, my old scoutmaster asked, Hey Roy, how about joining a gang with us? We are training us, he said, for using explosives, he said, if the Germans invade. We'd go on duty about uh, eight to half past in the evening. Sometimes after we'd been training with the home guards, marching and all the rest of it. And uh, we stay all night then. We got we had three shillings for that then. But we were expected to stay behind and train to be saboteurs. We had explosives. We had all all kinds of uh, devices for uh, delayed action. Tip wires, booby traps we could use. We, if, we, if we knew we were on a, a tomorrow, we got the pit and we died some of the explosive in the, in the fresh manure to keep it warm, not to get frostbitten. And we had uh, two thin short wires from it out into the grass so that we could find it. If, if the weather's very cold and the frost can affect the explosives, you see, make them very volatile and it explodes more easily. There were four horses on the colliery and they tipped this in one place so that everybody who wanted it could have their manure from the tip, you see. You do make it sound like lots of fun. Oh, yes. You know, the training. But yes. obviously, if the Germans oh. had invaded, it would have obviously got very, oh, yeah, very yeah, serious. Yeah. yeah. I found out the life expectancy was about seven to ten days, you see. But you imagine us amateurs against professional German soldiers. So how did you manage to keep all of your activities with the auxiliary units a, a secret uh, from your parents? The thing was, nobody had any idea what we had in their possession. I got married and went to Glencorog to live. But uh, the following week, my mother had to notice, oh, there's a, a wooden box under Roy's bed. I better take that back to the home guards. So she had two of my brothers to pull it out and two and carried it. When I told her years after what was in it, she nearly died. There was a Thompson submachine gun and 3,000 rounds of ammunition in it. So that's the kind of secrecy we had. All these things were there. You had them at home, but nobody knew. I often wonder what would have happened if we were asked to be active in, uh, and it did happen, the Germans had invaded. Perhaps we were pretty well trained as amateurs, but we were still amateurs against professional army soldiers, weren't we? Most people had absolutely no idea that their fathers or their husbands were involved with the auxiliary units, uh, and that was certainly the case for the person who I have come to meet in the churchyard of my own village of Llanderi Rudach, uh, David Evans. Hello, David. Thanks for joining oh. me. It's a beautiful setting, isn't it? It's about four miles outside of Abergavenny. There's a wooded hillside, a small grouping of houses around the village green, and then on this slope that is leading out of the village, this very beautiful and this very interesting-looking church, isn't it? Yes, it is. Now, this was the church where your father was the reverend during the war, is that yes. right? Yes, he came here in um, 1937 and left in '45. so he was here all the war years. And over that period... What exactly was his involvement in the auxiliary units? Well, he was part of this special duties um, unit that was based around Lundery Ruddach, and I think there were probably at least six or seven other people in this unit. There were two other vicars. There was um, an agricultural worker, an undertaker, so quite an assortment of people, really. These people used to just go out to collect intelligence rather than active. They weren't a combat patrol. They were just intelligence gathering. Right. And so what was your father's uh, role within that intelligence unit? Because, I mean, he wouldn't have been actually going out and finding the intelligence himself, was he? Or... Well, I think they were hopeful that people like him, because he was travelling around the area, that if he saw anything that unusual, any uh, German occupation in any sort of way, that they could then relay this information back to headquarters. And um, a person called George Vater was the runner for this unit. As the story goes, messages used to be left by him for my father in a stone outside this church, mm. in the church wall. Have you got any idea of where that stone and where that gap in the wall is here? Or? Well, I, I've only been able to um, try and find out from local people, yeah. and they seem to think it's in the wall where the, the upper entrance to the churchyard is, oh, and is. on the roadside of that wall. Right. So actually, around the other side of this magnificent yew tree, and somewhere in this stone wall that uh, divides the churchyard from the road. Yes. 
This would happen in the other way as well, that George Vater would pick up messages from that point and he would then take them to the next but one parish, which is Lentilio Creseni, and um, apparently the vicar there had a radio under his altar and he was the one that actually transmitted these messages then back to headquarters. Wow. It's absolutely amazing, isn't it? You know, this idea of these rural vicars as being you know, part of this... Um in this wireless network. From what you knew of your father, was this the kind of thing that you would have expected of him or was it quite a surprise? No, he was uh, quite a quiet, unassuming man and um, maybe that was why they chose him, really, because um, he could be going about his normal work uh, quietly and um, if he saw anything unusual, then he he would pick it up. Mm, Of course, you know, and standing here now, I mean, you couldn't get a more idyllic country churchyard could you you couldn't get a more innocent looking place yes. so i mean um you'd have to think that these rural uh, vicars they were well chosen for this job weren't they yes i think they just used to go out at night and uh, a lot of girls on their horses boys on their bikes just putting messages into split tennis balls into gate posts and then they would just go back to bed and then get up for their ordinary jobs during the day how extraordinary yeah. to think that they were doing that and their yeah. parents and their brothers and sisters would no. have no idea no, of their no. involvement. No. no, I've come now to um, some rural high ground just above Newport with uh, Sally Mogford. We've got an amazing view from here, haven't we? Yes, on a clear day you can see 11 counties from here and the auxiliary units stationed up here would have had a very good view of any activity on the Bristol Channel down there. Is this the sort of typical kind of landscape for the bunkers that were in this part? Wales. It is a typical location because it was rural, it's isolated, it's, uh, it's very heavily wooded. Um, during the war years there would have been very few houses up here at the time, so they could have operated up here in relative secrecy without too many people stumbling across what, what they were doing up here. So this is typical of a setting where the auxiliary units were built. So how did you come to first get so interested in these operational bases, in the auxiliary unit bunkers? Many years ago, I visited Orador in France, and during the war, the SS Panzer Division wiped out a complete village because they suspected a resistance cell was operating from there. And it had such a profound effect on me because I thought this would have been the fate of my mother and my grandmother and my aunt. So I resolved that when I got back to Britain, I would find out as much as I could about what my grandfather was involved in uh, with the British resistance. So that was the link. Your yes. grandfather was actually a member of uh, one of the local patrols. Yes, so. he was a yeah. member of Jonah Patrol. And my great uncle was also a member of Jonah Patrol. That was his brother. There were eight Monmouthshire patrols in all. So when you started to investigate the history of the um, organisation and what your grandfather would have been up to, I mean, what have you discovered about uh, Jonah Patrol specifically? I discovered um, that they were the deadliest of all the Monmouthshire patrols. They were the most highly trained and they were the most um, diligent with their training. Uh, They used to come up here twice a week training and they also used to sleep in the bunker for one night on the weekends. So what excuse did your grandfather give to your grandmother on those nights? (laughs) That he was in the Home Guard. Right. They all used the excuse that they were in the Home Guard, but they weren't. They just wore the Home Guard uniform and it gave them an excuse to go out and say, I'm going off to do my home guard duties, but they weren't. They were up here crawling around in the undergrowth in their home guard overalls with their faces blackened out. (laughs) They would have always come up here at night and they wouldn't have walked up here like we're walking now. They'd be in the undergrowth then on their their stomachs just to remain hidden. So they were trained to that extent, weren't they, that they could move across the country that they knew very well. Um, They could sleep out look after themselves, live off the land if necessary. So when the patrol that would have been operating from the bunker that was up here, when they were operating, have you got any idea what their main targets were, what their role would have been? They would have been sort of uh, to hinder the enemy's advance, to disrupt all their vital supply lines, to blow up bridges, uh, roads. There's a a huge cordite factory just down the road, which the Germans would have loved to have uh, got their hands on, I dare say. So they would have been out to protect that. Perhaps even blow up the seven tunnel to stop the Germans getting into England. Uh, Here we have here is the ammunition bunker, or one of the two ammunition bunkers. The second one, we don't know where it is, unfortunately. They lost one of their ammunition bunkers. We don't think it could possibly have been this one because it's only 60 metres away from the main operational base. Hold on, so when you say that they lost it, 
Does that mean that somewhere not too far from us now, there's a bunker full of ammunition? There was, until some children <laughs> fell into it in the 1960s. And um, it had to be cleared out by the bomb squad. <laughs> I'm slightly concerned that our possible um, resistance could lose a bunker full of ammunition. They, they had markers on the trees of where the, where the bunker was. And the Forestry Commission cut the trees down. That's how they lost it. Oh, my God. OK. We've been joined up here in the woods by Richard Frame, a, um, a local historian who also has an interest in the auxiliary units. I understand that you have a rather interesting document that's associated with the auxiliary units, is that right? That's right, yes. It's the, uh, the famous Highworth Fertiliser ah, yes. catalogue. So, hold on, so what this looks like from its cover, from the exterior, well, it actually says, The Countryman's Diary, 1939... And it has this, perhaps not particularly cryptic, fake advert. Highworth's fertilisers do their stuff unseen until you see results. <laughs> yeah, good, it? uh, yeah, it's fantastic. But obviously it's not a countryman's diary, is it? No, when you, turn it, when you open it up inside, now when you look at it, it looks really old-fashioned and you can't quite appreciate what you're looking at. This stuff, particularly the plastic explosives and the pencil fuses, which they're talking about in here, were absolutely cutting-edge technology. Yeah. You know, a lot of the weapons and stuff in here, this particular one here, the time pencil, for example, this had only just been invented. It talks about plastic explosive, which had only just been invented as well. And I find that quite a chilling book. I mean, as we said, the cover is even has that sense of humour about it, but when you, you open it and you see what these guys were going to be doing in terms of uh, sabotage... Um, These are phosphorus bombs, which again were fairly new technology, is a hand grenade. And on the back inside here, this bomb here, which you could carry, recommends you carry them inside your jacket, make them up before you go out on patrol, carry up to uh, quite a lot of them. Here you can see them, and it shows you how they're all made up. Yeah. You'd be expected to carry these out with you and then place them on whatever it is you were going to blow up. Absolutely fascinating to see, because I'll be honest, I've seen these under glass, you know, in, um, in cases at various exhibitions, but it's the first time I've actually had a chance to hold one. And it really is quite chilling, isn't it? Because it suddenly all gets very serious when you look at this. My grandfather actually stored phosphorus bombs in the cellar of his house, and um, at the end of the war, for the VE Day celebrations, the bonfire wouldn't light, so he put one of these phosphorus bombs onto the bonfire. <laughs> and it melted all the tarmac on the roads, so he had to sort of skulk off quietly before anyone realised what was on the bonfire. Uh, I think a few weeks after that, he, he and his brother tipped them over Newport Bridge just to get rid of them. And is that where they still are? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> probably. So, Richard, what can you tell me about this area that we're, we're walking through now? Because the path that we're walking down is, is actually very ancient, isn't it? It's very ancient. In fact, this was... I know we're not actually on it here, but if we were just... Uh, on the top of that ridge just there. This would have been the main road from London to Ireland, uh, dating right back to the earliest times. On, on our left here, we've got an Iron Age hill fort. In the middle of it, there is a Roman, possible Roman signalling tower. If the Romans wanted to signal across to the other side of, you know, the Bristol Channel. Uh -huh. uh, you've got the auxiliary bunker here, of course. And then just behind, we've got uh, a Norman Motton Bailey. So when the Normans invaded the area, they came along the high ground. When the Romans invaded the area, they came along the high ground. Yeah. You know, this is, this is a very important highway along here. It's amazing, isn't it? You really get a sense that it's a landscape that has been shaped by this tidal flow of invasion and resistance and an ongoing, you know, defence of the land, literally. Well, you, you mentioned tidal. I mean, of course, just down there you've got the River Usk, which is tidal, and Newbridge on Usk, which is a bit further up, is where the tidal ends. And the Normans used to bring their boats up here as far as Newbridge on Usk, where they built a, a Motton Bailey castle in their attempt to attack the Welsh at uh, Caleon. So this was the way they came in. It's astonishing. It makes you realise that somewhere that feels so uh, peaceful now... Uh, has only really experienced Bandit peace country. incredibly you know, recently. Uh, that this is a it's a bloodstained part of the world. It certainly it? is. Yeah. yeah. We're just about to uh, carry on walking along here. We're going to walk straight past the bunker. So I challenge you to spot it. Right. Okay. Well, I accept your challenge. Can you see it? Somewhat nervously. All right. Are we? So I should be able to see it from here, should I? Yeah. 
And is it camouflaged in any yeah. way? It is camouflaged, is it? Uh, well, <laughs> oh, actually, I'm sort of guessing that this sort of flat patch of ground just past that rock, is that sort of close? No, nope. no, nowhere close at all. <laughs> so close to it it's unbelievable well, unless it was this <laughs> yeah. ah I see I thought that was too obvious there's a big branch over it yeah. but yes okay it's still pretty well camouflaged isn't yeah. it that's great so if we just uh, take that branch off and this branch oh my god look at that and you see to brush these leaves off because it, it being autumn it's got a bit and now you can this is the bit that you, yeah. when you lift it up, you just, you, I always wonder whether there's somebody in there because <laughs> there are candles down in here. Really? Yeah. So people have gone in? Oh, yeah, and we don't know who it is. It's quite scary to be doing this because if you think about, you know, <laughs> if this had been the OB up there, you know, this would have been the moment that the men in it would have dreaded someone. Yeah. Well, the from interesting the top. thing in here is if we did have, well, as I've got in my pocket a hand grenade. <laughs> luckily it's not uh, I should just say that luckily it isn't live yeah. luckily it's not live but if I did drop this hand grenade down there and it was live that there is a blast wall just down there right. which would prevent um, any of this shrapnel banging forward into the man who may be down there right. well let's have a look alright so do we just you want to know if we lift it from this end oh if we get, okay and pull it towards us pull it towards that way there we are it's in incredible condition, this one. Say, that's in fantastic yeah. condition. The bricks... You yeah. Know, yeah, the bricks down there look brand new. Yes. I'll just make sure there's no one there. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> well, I'll tell it's you quite what, warm, I know I'll actually. If I ever... The heat that's coming out of here is amazing. God, you're right. It's actually warm. You can feel, you know, the heat mm. of... You can feel the heat of the earth down there. Yeah. Right, I'm going to drop down as well. Yeah, it's this is almost like um, an antechamber here, because then I'm assuming the bunker opens up yeah. through there, does it? Yeah. Okay, so going uh, deeper into the second part of the bunker. So if you just shine the torch up that end, oh, I see, right. You've got metal here, it hasn't even rusted, this one here. Yeah, I mean, you feel Fantastic like... condition, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. I mean, you feel like this bunker isn't going anywhere soon. Um, so these two, these two pipes at the end, which are ceramic pipes, are they? Mm -hmm. So those would have had the wires that would have led to some sort of an aerial outside, isn't it? It would have ran a, a few feet, a few metres away, probably, and then up a tree where it would have um, you know, transmitted the signal. And so how many men would have been expected to uh, work from down I here? It would have been one at a time. Right. right. You know what, once you're down here, the thing that you really notice is there's a very, a very different quality of silence, isn't there? You can feel that oddness in here, can't you? Yeah. That's fantastic, thank you so much. Let's go and let's go back Come above ground. <laughs> Mind your head. That is astonishing, and it's very weird to come from that darkness, you know, suddenly out into this wood. It's a very strange feeling. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for showing me that, you know, because I've done, I've done so much reading about the bunkers, and I've been to the locations of several, uh, but I've only ever seen a reconstructed bunker, um, and this is the first time I've been inside an authentic structure, and uh, it's an incredible experience, isn't it? Am I right in thinking that you've got plans for something to commemorate the men well, who would have served here? I'm still talking to a friend of mine who's a blacksmith. We're not sure. We're probably going to use the badge um, and, and do something with that in metal, but we haven't decided where to put it. We kind of quite like the idea of this kind of geocache thing where you've got to go out and find it using a map reference because yeah. we think it's quite appropriate that, you know, if you want to go and find something to do with the auxiliaries, you've got to make a bit of an effort. It should and be kind of, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you... You get given a grid reference, and off you go, and you try to find it. And it'll just be a little bit of... And you can sign a book or something to say you've been to visit it. Oh, that sounds lovely. It'd That's be fantastic. I hope that happens. That